Rose. That's uh, something quite interesting story will be brought by Jeff Dione, uh, maybe from Europe area, I guess, and maybe Robert Landry. So Jeff, are you ready now? I ah, should be ready. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, just perfect. Oh, excellent. OK, and I'm uh, here too. Good stuff. So let me open the presentation. Um, oh, it wants to open system preferences here. We need to turn this on. You are sharing your screen. Perfect. OK. And uh, let's go back here. So thanks everybody for um, for uh, joining today and and uh, thank you for uh, letting us give this presentation. Uh, we've been working on uh, the JCore processor, as some of you might know, for quite a few years. Uh, but I thought we would go through a short background just to make sure that uh, um, maybe new new members uh, know what it is that that we're talking about. Uh, so the JCore processor family is an open implementation of the Super H uh, instruction set architecture. And uh, um, it's uh, something that we've been using in various different uh, projects and products for about 10 years now. Um, it was reportedly the best selling CPU core in the 1990s for about three years. And there's good reason for that. Uh, it is quite efficient. Uh, the instruction set architecture is very well thought out and it works extremely well for the C language. Uh, so we have done some very small extensions. There wasn't much necessary, but uh, some things like SMP extensions were needed to support kind of modern Linux functionality for uh, not only um, uh, mutexes for SMP, but also mutexes for futexes and things like that that allow concurrency in Linux. Uh, this uh, system on chip core that we're talking about here today uh, has been in Linux mainline since 2016, so it's very well tested. Well, what are the outcomes of the talk that uh, we're giving here today? Well, the first. I just wanted, uh, to, yes, I go just ahead. wanted to say the slides are in the wiki if anyone wanted to download them and follow along. Yes, the slides have been uploaded. Um, uh, the first. The first uh, LSI that uh, we're working to tape out now uh, is a derivative of the J2 processor, which is uh, Super H SH2 compatible. And it's about 15K ASIC gates with a three stage pipeline. Uh, J1, which we will uh, show a little bit of synthesis today, hopefully the tools will cooperate, um, is about 30K ASIC gates. And it fits in fairly small FPGAs. But this family is uh, uh, fully upwards compatible. And uh, right now, the largest design or the most fully functioned design is J32, which has virtual memory and is 100K ASIC gates approximately. There's a uh, full memory management unit, cache controllers, uh, all of the things that you need to run Linux. The MMU has not been ported to Linux at this time, but the rest of the processor and the SOC platform is very well tested. And we'll talk about how you can use that in your own personal projects or in your own commercial projects a bit later. Um, so why did we do this? You know, what is the motivation for doing this? I think at a high level, uh, everybody knows that the openness of the Linux system is the key to its success. And what we wanted to do was to make sure that you can take the hardware all the way down to the gates, to the transistor level even, without having to use any proprietary components and try to replicate the success that Linux has had in the software space, also in the hardware space. And at first, this was possible because of the size that FPGAs have become lately. And we did a talk about that a long time ago with Kawasaki-san now. It's probably almost uh, almost six or seven years uh, since we've been doing that. Uh, so taking this to the ASIC space is the next 
uh, step, if you will, that lets you build products uh, that are affordable and accessible to just about anyone without Excuse having... Me. Yes, please. Excuse me, uh, can I yes. interrupt you? Uh, yes. The, maybe I'm afraid you you are not sharing the appropriate team screen right now, and the uh, sharing screen, sharing image is just staying on page one. It's just staying on page one. Mm. Now, but, now jump into that page four. Do you see the entire page four, or do yeah. you? Oh, okay. And, uh, entire, uh, and also maybe it's something of the uh, content creation, not a presentation mode screen. Right. So if I hit play, do yeah. you see? Did that work? The screen freezes when you full screen it. We only uh, see okay. it when you're not full screen. I apologize for that. I can't see what what I'm presenting. So thank you for. That here, let me see if I can. Um, there is a bug in Microsoft Teams on the Mac. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me see if I can increase the the view size. Sure. That's quite helpful. Yeah. Sorry oh, about great. that. Yeah. OK. Uh, now, will... now you are presenting a page four. <laughs> I apologize. Maybe I can hide this also. Ah, perfect. OK. OK, so here was the background slide. Uh, I'm sorry about that. And uh, this is a roadmap slide, which um, uh, probably no one had seen. Uh, so if there's anything unclear, please uh, stop me again, and we can we can go over the points there. Um, so yeah, uh, I was I was saying that uh, we built this to try to democratize the space <clears throat> for hardware as well as software. And we learned that this is uh, very advantageous when we were developing some products in the electrical grid space, where we had a fairly large FPGA with no outside MICON or, or CPU core or anything like that. Everything was inside. Uh, it had multiple processor cores and DSPs uh, inside it. And this is a realistic way to develop um, very unique products uh, for anybody. And now, uh, in the past two years, one thing that has changed is that the tool flows are available so that you can do this mostly with open source tools. Uh, and that's a very exciting change. So here is a simple application that uh, we have developed uh, recently. Um, Jeff, may I clarify? Please. Um, the open source tools for Lattice have been available to create fully open source bitstream generation, but only for Lattice, not for Xilinx. But Lattice has now shipped ECP5, which is bigger but slow, but can, can emulate the whole processor we're doing, even the big ones. And we have documented a method by which we squash our VHDL. We compile our VHDL to abstract, abstract syntax tree and then to netlist and have Xilinx toolchain do only final packaging step for that uh, FPGA family into Bitstream. So both toolchains can target both FPGA families now lat lattice fully openly. It runs everything just more slowly. And then for the fast one, we only use a small part of the proprietary tool chain. Right. So uh, further clarification, uh, Xilinx and Lattice are FPGA companies. Uh, the, they're sort of two of the big three. The third one was Altera, has now been uh, bought by Intel. Um, so uh, this is just good technology, uh, essentially. Um, if you are looking for uh, a way to produce a chipset or um, uh, functionality for a chipset that isn't available off the shelf or to control your entire supply chain, this is a good way to do that. Um, the SH Compact Instruction Set Architecture was an excellent foundation to start with. Uh, 
and the jcore implementation we assert is uh, very clean uh, easy to use and it was designed from the ground up to do signal processing and network and to run linux and that's uh, uh, the foundation of a of a good hardware product so why go all the way to asic well we found that uh, these days there's a tremendous amount of question about cybersecurity, and this is the reason that seems to resonate with with many people it's quite easy or it was until the supply chain crunch to purchase uh, off the shelf system on chips uh, but if you want to know uh, what's in your device to own your own data and to also have guarantees of both network security and the security of the device itself it's important for some people to go all the way down to the gates there's also uh, for us uh, an even more important reason and that's to enable innovation and development for our own community and for ourselves uh, the chips that you see up here on the right hand side uh, are some chips that we had done with TSMC and that experience uh, showed us that there was a need to do the entire backend processing of an ASIC with open tools. So uh, that experience produced a really interesting chip. But from our point of view, even though we own the, the, the mask sets, some of the intellectual property cores are closed and we can't see what's in our own chips. And that's a problem for us. Uh, that's a problem for the traditional um, uh, fab model for the, the pure play fab model. So enter open source and open hardware and uh, completely open implementations are the driving philosophy for how you solve these sorts of problems. And, and again, Linux was a solution to that in the software space and the number of participants in the jamboree here today show that that has been a success across the world and across all sorts of industries. And so while the JCore RTL has been available under an open source license for a long time, the tools are now available under appropriate open source licenses to go almost all the way uh, through to a mask set. Um, and if you need hardware uh, uh, platforms to do your development on, that's available under open source licenses too. We've made more than just a reference design available. Uh, you can uh, get that board or have those boards built for yourself. We have we have some available. We'd, we'd like to make more available, um, uh, something like a Kickstarter or a group buy as possible. Um, the, the complete mature Linux OS tool chains and, uh, and complete Linux OS platform is available, but so now is the hardware to run that on. So this board in the background, uh, we call it the turtle board, is a very small platform that has an FPGA instead of an ARM processor or an ARM SOC, and it is functionally equivalent to uh, Raspberry Pi, but now everything inside is an open core. And with this board, you can build your own SOC with the JCore base SOC platform. It's a, a symmetric multiprocessor with Ethernet, uh, USB, all the things that you need, HDMI. Uh, and on top of that, build the peripherals of the SOC that you need by putting a board where the Raspberry Pi hat would normally go. And this feels like a normal Linux system. So all the development tools that you're used to, uh, uh, from Toybox at the top, uh, MuscleLibc, the Linux kernel bootloader, all of that layer is familiar to all the people on this call. And the layer below is provided by the jCore SOC platform and the hardware platform board is open and you can download the EagleCAD files for it and have it manufactured. So then what are the tools and components that are necessary to build out a system 
using that uh, type of tool chain? Well, you can simulate first using GHDL and YOSIS. Um, these are uh, really important components. If you're a Verilog developer, YOSIS does that by itself. Uh, if you do your work in VHDL, uh, and we do, uh, then GHDL has a plugin for YOSIS that lets you do synthesis to a netlist uh, using that. Um, you can uh, use the test benches that are available, but you can also do, as Rob said, a synthesis directly to an FPGA bitstream and test your own chipset running Linux uh, with fully open tools, uh, with the exception of the place and route for Xilinx. Um, and all the scripts to do that are there. And we'd like to hear from the community if a Docker image to help folks get started might be a useful way to go. Uh, building all the tools, GHDL plus EOSIS and NextPNR, um, uh, is a bit of a lift. Uh, what I'd like to do right now before we get to the next slide is try and show you a build. Let me see if I can do that. Um, uh, let's see here. What does this do? Maybe this. Yep. Yeah, OK. And so I will switch to uh, another window here. And let me see if I can get that. Can everybody see? Yeah. OK. So I'm going to clone the source code for uh, for um, the jcore j1. And I will just make the uh, bitstream uh, or uh, for uh, ice 40 here. And you can see that the thing is compiling all of the different modules. And we're going to use this a bit later in the talk to lay out a small uh, module using the open tools. You can see all of the different uh, components of the uh, of the CPU core are being uh, synthesized into Netlist right now with Yosis. And it takes a bit of time, so we'll let it go after we get uh, past this point. Yeah. So just this quickly, you can uh, uh, iterate very quickly your designs. Um, if I scroll up here, uh, JCore is fairly small. This is a fully SH2 compatible device. It's taking up uh, 4,705 cells inside of an ICE40 FPGA. It's uh, five US dollars, uh, and it has about 5,200 uh, cells. And so this is going to place and route. Uh, it's not very interesting. I'll switch back to the slides while it does that. OK. Um, so how do you take that FPGA flow and turn that into a flow for ASIC? Well, there's uh, two, almost three, two and a half uh, choices for that right now. Uh, some people might have heard about uh, Google's Open Lane initiative with Skywater, uh, and that's built on top of DARPA Open Road, which is a complete ASIC flow uh, built on top of Yosis that we just saw, uh, targeting uh, uh, Skywater. Uh, it's a US fab, uh, 130 nanometer uh, PDK uh, a process development kit. Uh, and the Open PDK project from uh, uh, from from Google and Skywater uh, gives you all of the data, and it's actually pretty interesting. Uh, we'll take a look at what's available there in a minute. And what we just saw was the beginning of Qflow 1.4, uh, which is what we'll use in a minute to uh, if if the Microsoft. Um, uh, uh, teams is going to cooperate. We'll we'll try to to do a place and route in one of the modules. Um, uh, I would also yes. point out that Jeff is running this on a Mac Mini because that was the machine he could get teams to work on. This is not our most powerful server. 
not our most powerful server. So uh, um, it is portable. Uh, you can run it on Mac, which is BSD uh, Unix, or you can run it on Linux. It runs a lot better on Linux, of course. Um, uh, some people have even run it on Microsoft products. Uh, so there, are, there's a couple of fabrication options that are supported. And uh, we spent a bunch of time last year working uh, on Austral Microsystems AMS. Um, a very old process because access to AMS for a small chip is only about uh, 2,000 euro. And that's accessible to an individual person. The problem is um, uh, it's a quite, a quite an old process. It's a 0 0.35 micron process with three metal layers. And the tools kind of struggle to do something as complex as JCore in only three metal layers. So we hope that we can figure that out. And then you can kind of go through Euro practice uh, to get that. There's the equivalent of Euro practice in, in Japan also, and also universities have access to these processes. But for an individual person to do research at you know 2,000 euros, you have to think a little bit, okay, do I really want to? But it's, but it's doable, it's really an accessible thing. But then everything changed with uh, Google's involvement with Skywater. Uh, they announced the availability of uh, 130 nanometer. That's a pretty modern, it's a late 90s process, but not just bulk silicon. Uh, this process is a mixed signal fab and it has all the features that you could ever expect. You can build just about anything on this process, uh, including high voltage devices for uh, uh, something like automotive or uh, MOSFET drivers. Uh, you can do bipolar uh, transistors um, uh, specified all the way up into the gigahertz regions. So you can do radios on this process. Those they top have. layers can accept five volt signals. The middle layers can accept 3.3 volt signals. The bottom layers can do yeah. one point something volt signals. Yeah. So the so the, the 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 MOSFETs that are available here, uh, there's as Rob said, all all different all different uh, uh, voltage withstands. Um, it also has uh, uh, Sonos cells, so you can do uh, you can do flash memory. I don't think anybody in the open source has used those cells. But the interesting thing is that all of these cells are available. And uh, we can just go and look at the library here. Um, I can grab it. I'm getting the hang of switching back and forth. So here, for instance, Google negotiated, is... Google negotiated with the vendor to release IP we are in the shadow of a very large corporation that has done the hard work of negotiation to get the information for this fab open sourced. The, the basic cells, the, the standard cells for most other fabs are heavily under NDA. Right, so if you have used um, something like Ohio State University standard cell library, uh, you know, they've been available for a long time. A lot of hobbyists have looked at them. The number of cells available is really small. Uh, it's not an industrial class process. Um, this is just uh, absolutely uh, tremendous. The contribution to the community that uh, Skywater has made through Google here. Um, you know, here's even um, uh, this one's this is pretty interesting. This is a scan cell. A scan flip flop, so you can even do built in self test and uh, ATPG automated test program generation uh, using this library set. And this particular library set on the screen is their low power library set, but they also have many other library sets also. Uh, let's see if we can quickly bring up a different one that's interesting. Maybe, maybe it's going to be too slow, so I, I won't do that right now. But there's an RF library, there's an IO library, there's SRAM cells, there, there are uh, uh, flash memory cells. This is, uh, how do I put it, the crown jewels, the, the 
the main uh, value of uh, a fab now available to the open source community to build really interesting things out of. And uh, with the um, uh, with the availability of the tools, it's now practical to actually do things. And look where I put the Jamboree slides. Here we go. OK. Yeah, I apologize for the slowness of my switching back and forth here. So uh, Skywater and, and uh, DARPA uh, and Google have made available this uh, open source flow. And basically, this part of the flow is what we were looking at a few minutes ago over in the, uh, uh, in the terminal window. Uh, it will be finished when we, when we go over there. Uh, essentially, it's taking the design of the CPU, uh, in our case, a small system on chip that uh, uh, runs a calculator, actually, um, and turning that into a netlist. And then Open Road uh, or Qflow will take that netlist and floor plan a chip from it and do all of the routing. And then from this side here over to the end, you're doing all of the extraction so you can do spice simulation and then uh, uh, fabrication steps uh, fabrication preparation steps like inserting antenna diodes so that uh, the, during the process it doesn't burn the gates of the transistors out. And then uh, static timing analysis to make sure that it meets your requirements. And then finally, streaming out the GDS file from the uh, uh, from not only the PDK, but also your design. And uh, Qflow is a um, lot easier. Go ahead. One more clarification. Yeah. When he says it runs a calculator, it runs a Hewlett Packard calculator simulator written in C. Right. Uh, we initially tested it under Linux and then we ported it to run as a uh, bare metal application at, as its own kernel. But it is it is not just a little calculator thing. It is a 32 bit. C++ application. Yeah, the calculator itself does 34 significant digits. It's um, it, it's a sophisticated application. It, it has over eight megabytes of uh, of data, uh, full uh, uh, full uh, decimal math. It's not floating point, uh, and a bunch of other things like that. It's a pretty pretty Pardon? interesting Pardon? test of the entire tool flow. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah. The reason that was an interesting hardware platform for us to target for initial development is it has a keyboard display and is battery powered standalone device. And so that's a, a really good uh, point. So that particular device um, is the $5 uh, non-volatile FPGA that uh, with the exception of the supply chain problems that are having right now, you can get that and build a system that runs uh, C++ uh, just like an Arduino, but with many, many, many times more memory connected to an SPI flash and be able to develop your own uh, IO cells or, uh, you know, in the past we found things like a SIRDES, like a serial to deserial. So if you're doing high speed A to D or something like that, uh, a normal uh, microcontroller isn't going to give you that kind of interface because it might be custom. So you either need an FPGA already, uh, so I may as well go this far, or uh, it gives you the freedom to do something you couldn't do otherwise. And, and then if that turns into a commercial product, while $5 is uh, not difficult, uh, depending on what the product is, you might want to go down to uh, just a few cents uh, by turning it into an ASIC and branching off from this flow at the end here uh, before it goes into the floor planning, you get the FPGA out one side and you get the ASIC out the other using the same tools. And it's, it's really very cool. So here is uh, an example place and route from uh, 
from Qflow tools. And uh, if we look here, uh, I'm not sure how quickly this is going to run, uh, but uh, basically this is one hour's worth of, of uh, CPU time to place and route the J1 CPU, which is uh, about 44,000 gates. And that's really quite interesting. It's really very small for a complete uh, compliant uh, SH2 compatible core, uh, 0 0.226 millimeter square. That's tiny. Uh, 0.4, well, essentially 0.5 by 0.5 millimeter uh, in uh, Skywater 130 uh, high density cells. And that's without the register file being optimized. Just do something, right? It just did some, some, uh, some gates for that. So the complete design process is, is available. Uh, well, what does it actually look like? Maybe we can try and go back and uh, have a look where we were before since the synthesis is probably finished. So over here. And yeah, so uh, we didn't meet timing. That's okay. Doesn't matter. We managed 10.7 megahertz, but uh, we can just complete the make and it has made the file that you can load into your uh, uh, into your FPGA, and you have the complete microcontroller uh, in that short period of time directly from the GitHub sources. Uh, I clone directly from GitHub sources, all with open source tools. Um, so now we can go one step farther, and uh, I can try and launch Qflow and we'll build one of those modules into a chip uh, right here. So I'm going to use the GUI, um, Qflow GUI, and just launch it. And I need to change to the GUI, so let me do that over here in Teams. And where did it go? Can I find it? Edge test. I have too many windows open. I apologize. Maybe it's not going to let me do it. Uh, I really wanted to show that, but um, maybe it's not possible. Oh, here, right in front of my face. OK, so I will expand it out a little bit. And uh, we're going to choose a different um, uh, cell library. We're going to choose the OSU cells, uh, or not. <laughs> yeah, OK. Did you install them on this machine? Maybe not, but uh, uh, I have to choose this. Source. He was initially using this on a more powerful Mac, but Microsoft Teams kept crashing. Right, that's right. So timeout count, okay, set stop. Let's see if we can do it. Yeah, okay. So we got a good synthesis now for, so now I will run synthesis for ASIC. And you can see that it's done that. And the placer will run so quickly you won't be able to see the result because it's a very small module. Um, and complete. So there's the placement. Uh, we'll take a look at the final cell when it's finished. They run the static timing analysis. So my, my point of this is that actually anybody can do this um, if you really want to. Even routing of this simple cell is finished already. Uh, so post STA, migrate the cell to GDS. If we're lucky, we have no DRCs. The uh, that's okay. <laughs> uh, so well, we don't care. Um, Jeff, may I yeah. may I quickly summarize uh, place and route for the portion of the audience who doesn't already know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a design is written in a human readable language like 
VHDL or Verilog and is compiled to an abstract syntax tree and turned into a net list. A net list is two lists. It is a list of simple cells that, like yeah, it is a list of simple cells that the design uses, uh, which are analogous to machine code instructions. These are things that the circuit will need to do. And then route uh, is a net list. It is a list of pins, IO pins on each of those components that need to be connected to other IO pins on other components. So that list is scanned to make the set of branching wires that will have to connect the components together. The play stage is a tool that takes the list of components and positions them on a graph. It can rotate them, it can invert them, uh, it can swap them with each other to put them in a better position, but each each component is assigned a location and an orientation in the final design. That is the place. And then route is drawing wires between each of the IO pins on the resulting component to connect together everything that needs to connect together, which also includes power lines, ground lines, clock lines, and it has to connect to an outer ring uh, called a pad ring that talks to the outside world and has the properly buffered IO pins. It's the source of the clock, it's the source of power and so on. So there is place, there is route, and then there is a design rule check that happens looking for errors, mostly things too close to each other so that they will interfere in the resulting design. So a successful design will be placed, it will be routed, and it will pass design rule check. So this is um, an example of that. I was kind of hoping that we would get past LDS, but there's an error in one of the scripts. Uh, I apologize, but uh, this is a different block. And uh, as uh, Rob said, the placer will go and put the cells in different places. So uh, here is the D flip flop, uh, for instance. There's a bunch of them in this design, and the placer has found by a process called simulated annealing. It essentially uh, pulls everything together based upon the wiring that's necessary to hook it up um, uh, into, uh, into this placement grid. And then the router has gone through and added the wires to connect it. And it's a little bit busy. It's hard to see, but it's, it's pretty... Uh, intuitive once you once you get used to it where where the wires are and each of these colors uh, is a different metal layer and this is another open source tool this is called K layout now the tool that uh, is used to actually edit the design check the design rules and all of that is called magic it's an open source tool from Berkeley uh, it was originally written um, many, many years ago in the, in the 90s. And it's very difficult to use, uh, but uh, the tools mostly use it as a command line tool. Uh, and you can use K layout to look at your cells. If you want to do that, it's much easier. So for instance, here's the clock tree. Um, uh, it's put the clock tree over here for this particular cell. And these green lines are these green tracks down the center here. These are the power stripes added by Qflow to this particular cell. It's a pretty simple cell. This is, a, this is an 8-bit counter uh, that's used in, internally in the design. And uh, obviously just one of the cells in the library and then the cells that are actually placed. So I'll go back to the uh, slide deck. Okay, slides. So uh, in summary, the, the process here is uh, if you have a design concept, you can make a prototype of it with an auto-generated SOC template from the JCore project and run it on a piece of hardware that um, uh, you can choose from a few different uh, pieces of hardware that are available from other people or from us, or you can make your own, and it's actually really FPGA not that hard, hardware. FPGA hardware. 
and then develop and run the software on it with a real hardware interface. And that's important because now essentially you have reduced the risk. So if you want to take it farther and do an ASIC, you know it's going to work because it's already worked in FPGA. The only risk that's available or that, that remains at that point is do the tools work properly? Does it actually pass DRC before you decide to send it? Uh, or is there a bug in the tools? And For the uh, software developers, imagine if right. you compiled it for x86 with GCC exactly. against glibc, and right. now you need to compile it for ARM with LLVM against Bionic. Right, so the, the same front end is used, right? So if you use, uh, if you use C front, uh, and LLVM, or or what do they call it? Not Seafront. Um, uh, if you use Clang uh, and and LLVM on a Mac, and use LLVM as the back end for whatever ARM processor you're using, you eliminate more risk. Well, the same thing happens here with uh, Yosis and GHDL. The same language front end is used for the FPGA tools as the ASIC tools. And that's a really big change. That, that's something that's really important because you know that the tools are going to interpret the, uh, the RTL source code for your design the same way in both cases. And, then and in fact, go, in our toolchain flow, we build for FPGA and then right. we grab the abstract syntax tree that was produced by that build and feed it into our ASIC. Right, that's what I what I was uh, trying to demonstrate. I'm sorry if it was unclear previously. The the I built the core for FPGA and then took the intermediate result and fed it into the ASIC backend to place and route. And and that's that's a stunning thing. That's that's something that even no uh, closed source tool can do. Uh, and then you can tape out on a low cost process, uh, build a hardware board. Uh, that is basically a derivative of the FPGA board. Of course, the pins are different, but you know that a hardware is going to be pretty close uh, and your software will go directly over. So uh, this is just the start of this journey for us. Um, uh, we have only ever done uh, our chips, um, you know, here, for instance, or um, do I have a picture of uh, one of our dies? Maybe not. Um, using uh, using closed source tools before, uh, so this uh, is something we uh, wonder if this group is interested in. As we go down the process, uh, we'd love to come back and um, and uh, show you our findings uh, as we go from uh, RTL design all the way through the fab, hopefully at Skywater, we haven't decided yet, uh, and build uh, physical hardware. So uh, I guess thank you very much. Is there any questions? Um, if I could add one note. Yeah. An advantage of us making our own mask file that we can examine in those graphical tools he was showing is we know what the resulting chip should look like. So if we get a chip back from the fab and decap it, and view it under an electron microscope, we can actually see if what came back from the fab matched what we sent them or was notably modified in some way. Whereas if it went through a black box tool chain, we have no idea what they actually made. Right, so if security is your uh, main concern, and for some of our customers, security is a big deal, uh, uh, they may actually do a comparison at the physical level. All right. Um, thank you for that. Uh, as I said, just the start of the story. And uh, uh, there are some links at the end of the slide deck to show you where the tools are and uh, how you can get them. Uh, uh, the Open Road project is available as a Docker. Uh, the JCore uh, stuff, uh, uh, if people would like us to make a Docker, please let us know. We'll do that. Uh, it might be the easiest way for people to get started. Okay. Is, yeah. it, is there any other questions or some other comments? 
should be uh, quite an interesting project that is uh, origin from the Hitachi's Super H. Yes, uh, that's uh, absolutely right. Um, it's uh, uh, it's an amazing technology. There was a lot of work put into it uh, by the Hitachi engineers, and they got many many things right. Uh, and uh, we are thankful that we get to uh, uh, use that technology today. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Munakata-san, do you have any comments or some of the suggestions or that kind of things? Yeah, so, Jeff, thank you for the talk, but uh, the most of the attendee today is a uh, software guy. But, right, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. But it reminds me of the very old good days uh, to make a silicon yeah, 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 uh, hand graph yeah. like a hand graph. So, but yes. it's very interesting. Yeah, definitely, the, especially for the EDA2, is uh, moving to the open source direction. So we want to see the, what's happening in the future. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. and it's very interesting because the the developers that are working on this at Google right now, the the open lane, open road developers at Google, are mostly Python developers. They uh, they are not from the silicon side, and mm. they do things in a way that uh, you know we are hardware guys, right? So so uh, uh, we we don't necessarily agree with all the choices that they make, but uh, in the case of things like a Docker image. Uh, it's just really easy for a software developer to suddenly say, hey, maybe I will try this because uh, it doesn't cost me anything. I can download the PDK mm -hmm. and uh, open road Docker and see what I can do. And their tutorial gets you a chip in, uh, in just a few minutes. It's uh, really amazing to see the enablement of uh, a new community. Yeah. Quite interesting. Yeah. <laughs> ah, interesting. I, I think that these days the uh, some borderline in between the software technology and hardware technology will become quite close and close, and uh, making some of the uh, some of the uh, approach together uh, uh, for the software oriented, you know, na na natives. I think is finally the realization of uh, what we used to call co-design, right? Yeah. So the software is designed at the same time. Right as a hardware by the same people. Yeah. OK, well, anyway, thank you very much. Thank you very much and uh, good day and enjoy. Uh, unfortunately, the next presentation will be uh, performed in Japanese so that uh, I'm afraid you will not be able to uh, enjoy.